Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Shaw Prize Lecture in Life Science and Medicine by Professor Maria Jason, the Shaw Laureate in Life Science and Medicine 2019. May I first invite Professor Andrew Chang, head of Shaw College, to deliver his welcoming address. Professor Chang, please. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> First of all, thanks for coming all the way to Shaw College. Um, Professor Jason, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Shaw College, I would like to welcome you all to this Shaw Prize Lecture in Life Science and Medicine 2019. For your information, our close association with Sir Raymond Shaw started in 1986. This is a very important year. Do you know why? I joined this university in 1986. <laughs> and that's why I was being assigned to Shaw College. It's that simple. A lot of people ask me, how come, why Shaw? So, of course, my chance of my luck. Huh? And Professor Chen is my the college head at the time, right? <laughs> in 1986, when the college was founded, uh, and, of course, Sir Run Run became our patron. In his later years, Sir Run Run resolved to devote his effort and time to establish something very significant called the Shaw Prize. That's in the year of 2002. And something worth mentioning is the establishment of the Shaw Prize was formally announced where? Where? Here, in this auditorium. So this is a very memorable place. At least it's widely known, the Shaw Prize is an international award to recognize imaginative individuals who have contributed to furthering societal progress. So medicine, societal, you have to put the linkage between the two. Enhancing, enhancing the quality of life, medicine, bioscience, quality of life. And of course, enriching humanity's spiritual civilization. At the end of the day, that's culture, civilizations, that matters. The Shaw Prize consists of three annual awards, astronomy, life science and medicine, and medical sciences. This year, we are honored to have invited Professor Maria Jason to deliver this lecture. We are also grateful that Mr. Jack Wong, thank you, Jack, from the School of Life Science, uh, he would introduce Professor Jason and moderate the Q&A sessions later on. So be kind to the both of them. <laughs> they are very kind. The college is deeply honored to have a common benefactor with the Shaw Prize. And we are also exceptionally delighted to have the opportunity to learn from the world's foremost scientist and billion mind. Now may I pass the time back to the MC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Cheng. May I now invite Professor Wong Weng Tak, Jack from the School of Life Science, our moderator today, to introduce the laureate. Professor Wong, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jack Wong from the School of Life Science. It gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Maria Jason, the winner of this year's Shaw Prize in Life Science and Medicine. Professor Jason, received her PhD in biochemistry from MIT in 1984 before undertaking postdoctoral training at the University of Suresh and Stanford University with the mentorship from Professor Paul Burke, the 1980 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry. Dr. Maria Jason is currently uh, a full professor at Cornell University and a principal investigator at the Memorial um, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She's also a member of the US National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine, and National and Academy, uh, and American Academy of Art and Science. So um, in 1994, Professor Jason and her team published their seminal work describing that double-strand DNA could be introduced at specific chromosomal regions. They discovered an expression vector 
which contains an 18 base pair recognition sequence. When this vector is introduced into mammalian cells, Professor Jason discovered that it can cause, it can induce homologous recombination. At the time, Professor Jason modestly described and concluded that this may facilitate the creation of genetic, of subtle genetic alterations at targeted loci. And indeed, this discovery enabled the development of efficient modification methods of the mammalian genomes by site-specific nuclease, which is now currently exploited for genetic, um, for, for uh, gene therapy and basic research. Professor Jason is the first scientist to demonstrate the possibility of genome editing of genome editing in mammalian cells. So her group found that DNA breaks, double strand break can can induce gen um, genetic recombination, and her work enabled the discovery the discovery of future um, genome editing tool, such as the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Aside from this, Professor Jason also discovered that the tumor suppressor genes, the BRCA1 and BRCA2, they play important roles in homologous recombination. So these discoveries enabled the novel therapies to be developed especially for illnesses such as hereditary diseases and cancer. So without further ado, um, let's welcome Professor Maria Jason to deliver the short lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you um, for the lovely uh, introduction, and it's really terrific uh, being here. Thank you uh, so much for coming uh, this afternoon. I look forward to telling you about the work uh, in our lab, actually from a few different uh, angles. Uh, firstly, um, I'm gonna give you some background in, in terms of how we got to uh, where we are in, um, uh, for the experiments that led to the Shaw Prize. And uh, then I'm going to tell uh, two short stories, one on how uh, we use uh, artificial double-strand breaks to uh, create genomic rearrangements, and then secondly, a more natural situation where uh, the cell introduces double-strand breaks to, uh, for reproduction, so in uh, meiotic recombination. Uh, so two quite different systems, but um, uh, it, I think it, it, this broad approach will show you how uh, interesting uh, considering double-strand break formation and repair is. So um, maybe the introduction here isn't so necessary, but uh, um, a question that could be asked is, why would you want to modify the genome? Well, maybe many of you already do that in your labs, but um, the original uh, way we were doing genetics in the um, maybe early 1900s to uh, 1980s was uh, focused on a forward genetic approach where we'd um, have uh, a mouse mutant or a yeast mutant or a cell, cell line mutant and, uh, and you'd have some uh, phenotype and then eventually maybe this was a, sp a spontaneous mutant or uh, some kind of induced mutation uh, for some phenotype you were interested in. Uh, and then people would try and, uh, once we had some genomic uh, information, uh, understand where the mutation is, what the gene is, what the gene does. But um, once the uh, genome was sequenced, uh, what really uh, spurred a lot of research is this reverse genetic approach where uh, people would start um, by uh, wanting to mutate the genome, uh, 
to uh, get certain phenotypes or to ask what phenotypes could happen uh, when the genome uh, was mutated. Now, um, this was much more uh, approachable in uh, yeast, but um, uh, of course now it's a wide open uh, field. And not only is this of biological interest, but it's of medical interest. So here's a, a girl who uh, was treated uh, using um, some modified T cells, um, and they were modified using uh, 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 genome editing approaches. So this is um, ba basically why we want to um, uh, have gene editing and uh, modify the genome. So um, my history as a graduate student at MIT started um, with a structure function uh, question uh, relating to the protein uh, I was studying. So doing in vitro mutagenesis of the, of the gene and uh, asking where the functional activities were. This was quite a large protein, uh, an essential gene, alanine tRNA synthetase for making proteins. And uh, there were um, multiple successful papers that came from this work under uh, the mentorship of my thesis advisor, uh, Paul Schimmel. And uh, although these, of course, were exciting for me as a student uh, to do, uh, the, the most powerful paper, um, I thought, um, uh, really was uh, this one that ended up in uh, Journal of Bacteriology because this is where I, ha I did my first uh, genome modification experiment. So this is, um, I wanted to mutate um, the, uh, the E. coli chromosome at this essential gene, um, and it was not possible to get a spontaneous mutant or an induced mutant because this was an essential gene. They were just uh, temperature-sensitive mutants that clearly had some uh, baseline function. So uh, following the paradigm of what was being done in yeast at the time, uh, I introduced a, a DNA fragment that would lead to disruption of the gene. And uh, to keep the cells alive, I had a plasmid uh, that uh, was actually temperature sensitive for, for replication. So if I raised the temperature, the cells would die because uh, they wouldn't have this protein. And then uh, my plan and what I did was to introduce uh, fragments of my gene in the structure uh, function relationship to understand where certain biochemical activities were. And this was so important for my work because um, I had, in the earlier version of the mutant cells, the temperature-sensitive ones, I could put in the N-terminus of the gene or the C-terminal coding region of the gene, and both of them would complement the temperature-sensitive phenotype. So unless there were two catalytic sites that were completely distinct, it suggested that there was some interaction between the fragments I would put in and the chromosomal sequence, so it made very hard, it made it very difficult to figure out uh, where the activity lied. So this experiment really um, uh, convinced me how important uh, genome modification was for understanding gene function. I didn't want to rely anymore on um, forward genetic approaches to get uh, mutant genes. I wanted to be able to mutate the gene in the, in the chromosome the way I wanted. So again, this was E. coli, and um, the um, approach I took was related to what was done in yeast very successfully uh, at the time, but uh, there was nothing similar in uh, mammalian cells. But still, I was quite intrigued about um, moving forward in mammalian cells, so for my postdoc, basically, could I take these kinds of approaches and apply them uh, to mammalian cells. Now, the, the work that had been done uh, about the time I started my um, postdoc included work from uh, Nobel laureate Oliver Smithies, and uh, he took an approach kind of like was what was done in yeast or what I did in E. coli to try and knock out um, the beta globin gene. And uh, he was able to get one clone in this, uh, I believe it was a science paper, uh, where uh, he got exactly um, this uh, event that he was trying to achieve in one of the alleles. Uh, 
So he looked at a total of uh, 9,700 clones to get this one clone. So it was very inefficient. So where were all the other, what did all the other clones look like? Well, they were random integrations of um, the, the plasma DNA that he put in uh, elsewhere in the genome, so not at all useful for studying globin gene function. So in the end, uh, it was uh, one in uh, almost 10,000 of the Neo plus clones, the selected clones, uh, but out of all the cell, <clears throat> out of all the cells, it was one in a million. So an extremely inefficient uh, process. So, okay, we can do this in mammalian cells. It's inefficient. Uh, it turned out about that time the most useful cell system really was mouse embryonic stem cells because if you did this kind of approach, you could then uh, make a mouse mutant. So of course. Uh, very powerful, and this work by Smithies and Capecchi uh, led, again, to the Nobel Prize. Um, but actually, um, that was very limited in scope. Um, it was <clears throat> not really uh, applied very much to human cells, and certainly not to even uh, other model organisms like um, worms or uh, flies. So um, the exception, though, um, was yeast in terms of how efficient you could do these things in yeast. And one of the influential papers, maybe the most influential um, paper for me, uh, as I was transitioning from my, uh, my graduate studies to my postdoc, was uh, this paper uh, from uh, a, few author, a few different authors at a few different institutions, led by Jack Shostak, who is also uh, uh, a Nobel laureate for telomeres. Uh, and this um, model uh, of, uh, was for homologous recombination involving DNA double-strand breaks. So double-strand breaks where both strands of the DNA are broken at approximately the same position. And uh, they postulated that um, after a DNA break, there would be a resection of one of um, the two um, strands and that would uh, invade a homologous sequence. And the completed repair reaction uh, is basically shown here, where um, the broken molecule picks up sequences from the unbroken molecule. So the broken molecule here that starts out blue ends up having some red sequences. But this is the red and the blue here are meant to represent very uh, homologous sequences, almost identical or identical sequences, such as uh, between allelic positions on chromosomes or uh, uh, sister chromatids. So this was um, basically a, a portion of the model that they uh, described. And uh, so uh, they really emphasized how when you had a double strand break, it would uh, uh, be repaired by homologous recombination, thereby stimulate homologous recombination, and could be a way to go for uh, doing genome modification. The mo their model that they originally developed was for um, uh, meiotic recombination, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, and uh, they were also, um, uh, uh, Terry Orweaver and Rod Rosting, doing experiments with double-strand breaks uh, in plasmids. So I modeled some of my experiments as a postdoc, first in Zurich, on uh, this uh, model, uh, where I would put uh, a double-strand break into uh, plasma DNA and ask uh, how it would recombine with uh, the chromosome sequence. Would it recombine with a chromosome sequence? And in fact, that worked out beautifully. Uh, the plasmid is here, it has a break, it picks up sequences from the chromosome, and uh, this was an experiment done with viral DNA, so it was a defective virus uh, on the plasmid, and it picks up sequences from the chromosome by homologous recombination, and uh, it was like 10% of the cells uh, then produced a uh, wild-type virus. A very f efficient reaction. but. Um, not, not what you want to do to modify the genome, but it really emphasized that there may be uh, similar pathways in mammalian cells as in yeast. 
So um, this was my first short postdoc, and then I did a kind of related uh, experiment, uh, this time with a selectable marker. And the hope in this case was um, with a selection scheme, I could uh, find events where uh, the plasmid, again containing a double strand break, would integrate into the genome. And in fact, I could get those, um, and those were highly dependent on having uh, a double strand break in the plasmid. Uh, it was not a simple event, but um, rather this integration event of the entire plasmid. Uh, but again, it supported the idea that um, double strand breaks in mammalian genomes would be recombinogenic. Uh, and uh, in this case now, um, lead to modification of the genome in this model system. But it was still uh, somewhat frustrating because these events were, I don't remember what the number is, but let's say not one in a million, but let, let's say maybe one in a thousand um, of the total cell population. So still not very frequent. They could be um, uh, found by the selection method. Uh, but it, it still showed a limitation for how to do gene modification. But thinking more about the Shostak et al. model of how homologous recombination works, and uh, as is shown here, the sequence that's modified here is the blue sequence. It picks up sequences from the red unbroken molecule. Uh, and so really uh, what you want here or what's happening here is that the molecule that's broken is the one that uh, picks up sequence information. Now that was very clear um, seeing the virus uh, that formed because the plasmid would pick up sequences. Uh, even in the integration event, um, that plasmid is picking up chromosomal sequences as uh, it integrates. But really, this um, pointed out that um, those experiments were deficient. Uh, I mean, they were exciting for me as a postdoc, but deficient because uh, what we really should be doing, I thought, was introducing a double strand break into the chromosome. So how, how were we going to do this? Um, for those of you that do recombinant DNA research and use restriction enzymes, you know most of those enzymes uh, which were around at that time have six base pair, four base pair recognition sequences. If you were to express those uh, nucleases in uh, mammalian cells, the mammalian genome would be trashed. So what we really needed was something on the order, uh, a nuclease on the order of 16 or more uh, base pairs in its recognition site. And luckily, uh, Bernard de Jones lab uh, in, at the Pasteur Institute in Paris had uh, described uh, an endonuclease called ISC1. The SCE uh, is from uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so again, the influence of research done in budding yeast. And um, so this is the structure of the endonuclease bound to its recognition sequence. And the critical thing was that this nuclease had an 18 base pair recognition sequence. So um, that, again, is on the order of, uh, if you do 4 to the 18, for how frequent there should be, um, by chance, an ISC1 recognition sequence in the mammalian genome, it would be uh, about one every 20 mammalian genomes of complexity. So it was unlikely that um, this yeast enzyme, even if it was expressed in mammalian cells, would uh, cut the genome except at the place that we wanted. So um, this, uh, we did some test experiments. For example, we could constitutively express this endonuclease in uh, mammalian cells, and uh, the cells were fine, so there weren't uh, sites. Uh, the, the enzyme was specific uh, the way it should be. Um, and uh, then we uh, went to do uh, the experiment to see if a double-strand break in the genome would uh, cause uh, an increase in recombination. And so this is the setup of the experiment. Uh, so this is uh, the genomic locus. Um, the white space indicates the double-strand break. And uh, we put in a homologous uh, fragment that was um, uh, meant to correct the mutation in the uh, gene in the chromosome. 
And uh, so this is uh, what we would call gene targeting, but now it would be gene editing because we're introducing a break into the genome and by homologous recombination. And this was uh, done by uh, my French postdocs, Philippe and Fatima. So uh, we did this experiment and it worked amazingly well. This is one of those experiments I can think back uh, when the postdocs told me, uh, look at these plates. We had hundreds of colonies on the plate that indicated that we had uh, this homologous uh, recombination event. Uh, so, of course, I hoped it would work. We were doing the experiment, but this was way better than um, I ever uh, dreamed of. So um, I'll get back to this more in a moment, but um, this uh, says in a very basic way that not only is this a way to modify the genome, but the cell must have the machinery to efficiently repair a double-strand break by homologous recombination. And so this means that homologous recombination is a DNA repair mechanism. And uh, I'll, again, I'll, I'll get back to that more uh, later. But considering the genome editing part of things, so this way we could very precisely modify the genomic locus uh, and, um, and, and get exactly the sequence that we wanted in there. But of note, uh, we also got these non-homologous end joining events. So in this case, it didn't use the fragment to repair the double strand break. Uh, the cell just put the two ends uh, together without any homology. So we call it non-homologous end joining. And so when the cell did this, uh, there would be small mutations, uh, typically deletion, small deletions under 10 bases or so. Or, um, uh, or small insertions, although we could see some larger uh, events as well. So this is the essence then of, um, you know, uh, you might often see uh, someone talking about gene editing. This is um, the basis of that uh, when it uses uh, double-strand break. So you could uh, introduce a break into the genome uh, with no uh, homolo homologous fragment, uh, and get non-homologous end joining events that would introduce mutations into the genome, knocking out a gene, for example, and um, uh, or uh, you can try getting a very precise uh, modification by introduce, uh, introducing a DNA fragment. So um, besides, uh, this involved uh, uh, originally a selection, uh, but we also did these experiments um, looking just at the, uh, at the DNA level. Uh, in uh, hamster cells, and uh, we could see uh, a few hours after expressing um, the IC1 endonuclease, uh, the fragments that would indicate uh, non-homologous end joining, and then a little less frequently, but still uh, frequent, uh, the homologous recombination uh, events. And so um, we estimated at that time that non-homologous end joining was about twofold higher than homologous recombination, but that both pathways were clearly uh, very present. This is, again, um, the structure of uh, ISC1 endonuclease, and <clears throat> so that's the enzyme we were working for, uh, with. In fact, um, we put our expression vector in uh, on adgene, um, the, um, uh, the site that um, provides plasmids to researchers, and to this day, people are still um, uh, getting uh, this DNA because um, uh, using ISC1 for double-strand break repair experiments uh, is, is still quite powerful. But for the purposes of gene editing and knocking out any gene in the genome or correcting uh, a disease locus, for example, the, the issue is you want to be able to introduce double-strand breaks anywhere, uh, not at the ISC1 site, but any 18 base pair site in the genome. Uh, and so how do you do that? And what is clear um, by the crystal structure with DNA is how complex the DNA um, uh, protein interactions are. So multiple uh, interactions, and this is um, basically at that time how we thought about protein-DNA interactions, not 
uh, not as some kind of module, but this highly interdigitated uh, interaction with uh, various bases and base pairs. So um, it, this was a problem then in applying our results right away from 1994, but um, over the next 20 years, uh, as, as you all know, there were multiple uh, attempts to generate uh, uh, nucleases that could uh, make double-strand breaks uh, anywhere in the genome at will. Uh, the first that was successful are zinc finger uh, nucleases. Uh, zinc fingers are modular protein uh, DNA binding domains, each zinc finger uh, uh, recognizing about um, uh, uh, three bases. Uh, so, um, so that gives some flexibility, and, and it took a, a whole company of protein engineers to uh, engineer uh, good, useful zinc fingers. But in 2005, they came out with uh, the Sangamo company came out uh, with uh, zinc finger nucleases that work extremely well to modify a human gene. So that was really a, a landmark uh, paper. And uh, for me, um, one of the really striking things was uh, that when they modified the genome, uh, in, for example, in T cells, both alleles were modified at once. Um, we never uh, did an experiment like that because we were using uh, the artificial ISC1 system, <clears throat> but they were able to see that both alleles could be efficiently modified at the same time, a really stunning finding. Uh, and then yet another stunning finding came along when uh, oh, one thing I should mention is uh, the zinc fingers are uh, what's recognizing uh, the DNA, uh, and then this nuclease domain from a restriction endonuclease was what was cutting uh, the DNA. So uh, a few years after this, um, uh, another remarkable discovery from plant pathogens came along. And this was a protein DNA recognition uh, sequence set uh, in, what, in which just about one amino acid, not, not uh, multiple amino acids in a zinc finger, but one uh, amino acid would direct um, the interaction with uh, one base pair of DNA. So you could put together, if you wanted to um, cleave an 18 base pair recognition site, you could put uh, 18 of these modules, uh, the tal effectors, uh, and uh, design uh, uh, a cleavage, uh, cleavage at any chromosomal site. This worked beautifully. And if CRISPR had never come along, this would have been fine for many, many applications. Not all, though, but many applications. And it was a beautiful uh, uh, structure, um, protein uh, DNA structure, um, that I don't have time to uh, go into. So um, OK, uh, we thought at this time, and in fact, we started using talons uh, very often, we thought at this time, again, that this could be um, the answer to our dreams of being able to put uh, a break anywhere in the genome. But by chance, uh, so the, the discovery of these protein DNA um, binding uh, domains was, again, by chance. Uh, it was um, uh, studying plant pathogens and just um, figuring out this DNA um, binding property of these um, proteins. And then right away, um, people started engineering them the way they had with zinc fingers to make uh, cleavage re reagents. Uh, but an even more surprising um, uh, discovery was um, the CRISPR system. Uh, and uh, I won't belabor this because probably many of you have used it, where um, the um, recognition uh, doesn't involve um, the protein so much as uh, a guide RNA. So instead of having to um, use uh, maybe more complicated uh, expression vectors of nucleases, in this case, it's just putting in an RNA that the nuclease um, Cas9 uh, could bind to and then uh, use Watson-Crick base pairing to get cleavage at the site. And I have to say, when, um, when we made our discovery in 94 and then uh, in either that original paper or a re review that I wrote 
uh, a couple of years uh, later, I suggested that the, the best way to um, generalize our findings was to have Watson-Crick base pairing. Now, I was envisaging maybe some uh, oligonucleotide approach that would be artificial, but this um, actually fulfills that. So uh, uh, just, you know, make your guide RNA and then you can uh, give it to Cas9 and it will uh, cleave where you want it to. So this uh, stunning finding, and I think even more stunning um, that uh, this is part of a bacterial uh, immune system, an adaptive immune system that uh, can help um, uh, bacteria fight off um, uh, uh, phage uh, viral pathogens that, that will kill it. The original um, approach that we were uh, taking and if we take uh, Cas9, that will cleave uh, at uh, exactly at the site that ISC1 cleaved at, we would get exactly the same uh, results. So even though the nucleases are completely uh, different uh, in structure and mechanism of how they cleave, uh, any of them, uh, the, um, the uh, ISC1, which is considered a meganuclease or homing endonuclease, zinc fingers, uh, talons or now CRISPR, uh, you can get either homologous or non-homologous uh, end joining uh, repair. And uh, at the base pair level, these all give different uh, types of overhangs. So um, uh, that's all I'm going to say about um, kind of the historical uh, stuff, but I do want to um, then kind of sum up what we've uh, learned over the, the years. So as I mentioned, um, this, these gene editing experiments prove to us how important homologous recombination was as a DNA repair mechanism in mammalian cells. Uh, and, uh, and then there were some stunning findings having to do with uh, homologous recombination genes are tumor suppressors uh, that they're required for uh, embryonic development and they're um, maybe not so uh, uh, surprisingly uh, re required for uh, reproduction to give rise to gametes. So a very uh, critical um, process. And I'll just mention some of the work that uh, we've done in this area. So um, we found that the BRCA1 and BRCA2 tumor suppressors, breast and ovarian tumor suppressors, are homologous recombination proteins, and that was done by a clinical uh, 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 person in the lab, who, a breast oncologist, Mary Ellen Moynihan. So we published that both BRCA1 and BRCA2 are critical for this uh, process. And also that uh, we could, in our findings, we uh, saw that BRCA1 works at a different step than BRCA2, and BRCA2 works um, very um, uh, directly at the strand invasion uh, step. I'll just show one more slide to emphasize how important homologous recombination is in uh, tumor genesis. BRCA1 and 2 are breast and uh, were found in breast and ovarian uh, um, cancer families. Um, uh, it was noted, I think, pretty soon after that um, also prostate cancer uh, would go and would tra <clears throat> track in some of those families. Eventually, uh, pancreatic cancer was also uh, found to uh, have some level of, B of BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And here's a study specifically looking at ovarian uh, cancers from Liz Swisher's lab um, at the University of Washington. And uh, she sequenced homologous recombination genes in a large panel of ovarian uh, cancers and found that uh, nearly a third of the tumors had mutations in homologous recombination genes. Some of these are germline mutations, others are somatic, uh, but together they add up to a, quite a large um, fraction. And most of the mutations are in BRCA1 or BRCA2, but um, there are other homologous recombination genes who, who are sometimes mu mutated and uh, give rise to uh, similar uh, tumor spectrum. So homologous recombination genes are clearly very critical uh, for tumor suppression. And the flip side of that is because homologous recombination is a DNA repair mechanism, 
uh, the cells will be sensitive to certain types of DNA damaging agents, and in fact, uh, uh, cross-linking agents like cisplatin, these cells are very sensitive to. And if you look at um, ovarian tumors um, that have BRCA1 or 2 mutations compared to those that do not, those patients actually respond a little better. And furthermore, um, people have been able to target, specifically target, this uh, homologous recombination defect by hitting another pathway of DNA repair uh, using uh, inhibitors of um, poly-ADB ribose polymerase uh, PARP inhibitors. So uh, knowing that these proteins were involved in homologous recombination led other investigators to, uh, to develop uh, agents that are now used in the clinic to target homologous recombination deficient tumors. So uh, we have kind of two sides of the coin. Uh, individuals that um, have uh, these mutations uh, are predisposed to uh, cancers, but uh, those uh, mutations predispose those tumors uh, to sensitivity to certain DNA damaging agents. So it's important, knowing the homologous recombination status of tumors is important both for understanding how the tumors arose or treating them. So again, emphasizing uh, the important role of homologous recombination. Uh, and I, I'll say one other thing there. Um, it's clear that uh, even if you don't find a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or a mutation in one of those other genes I mentioned, that cells can have homologous recombination deficiency, and it's quite an active area of investigation trying to figure out how to, how to determine which tumors are uh, in the clinic are deficient in homologous recombination, and therefore those patients can be treated with specific therapies. So. Um, uh, I also mentioned non-homologous end joining, and we've uh, done some forays into studying those as well. It's also uh, an important DNA repair mechanism in, in, in addition to being used for gene editing. Uh, these genes are also important uh, during uh, embryonic development, but uh, usually at a, a later step, um, but uh, a later uh, age in the embryos. And then it's uh, an important process in uh, the rearrangements that occur in the immune system. But um, non-homologous end joining, uh, unlike most homologous recombination events, can in fact, uh, besides leading to local mutations, can lead to some genomic uh, rearrangements. And uh, in particular, we've been studying chromosomal translocations. So now I'm going to talk about some more uh, recent work in terms of generating uh, chromosomal uh, translocations. Uh, for uh, initially, we were interested in what the non-homologous end joining mechanisms are, but in a collaboration with a uh, pathology lab at, um, at Sloan Kettering, uh, Christina uh, Antonescu, we've been uh, trying to generate um, translocations uh, from the standpoint of uh, understanding how the disease uh, comes about. So um, this was our first um, uh, experiment in uh, generating chromosomal translocations in mouse cells, um, and uh, it was simply uh, putting a double-strand break on each of two chromosomes, and uh, they would form uh, a chromosomal translocation by non-homologous end joining. Now, uh, it wasn't that simple. Uh, most um, uh, single break events like this are healed uh, just within the same uh, chromosome, but we found at some frequency about 10 to the minus 4, so we could get um, these chromosomal translocations. So uh, at that low frequency, we were using uh, a selection system. But um, there are a number of tumors that have um, very specific reciprocal uh, translocations. Uh, leukemias, especially uh, well-noted lymphomas, uh, surprisingly, more recently in, um, uh, in epithelial tumors and prostate tumors, um, there are some uh, very specific uh, oncogenic uh, translocations. In our uh, lab, we've focused more on a, um, a, a diverse class of uh, tumors. Uh, these are sarcomas or sarcoma-like um, uh, uh, tumors because 
uh, in, at least in part, um, because um, the treatment options are so limited and uh, there's so little known often about um, the etiology of the diseases. So um, one um, gene that's often involved is uh, the EWS uh, gene, and it's often a fusion from uh, the EWS gene with another gene that uh, has uh, a DNA binding uh, domain, and this fusion protein then means that there's um, uh, a, a new set of genes that is activated uh, upon chromosomal uh, translocation. So um, you can see EWS has a number of different partners and a number of different types of uh, um, sarcomas um, uh, have been classified that have um, these various translocations. So um, this is what it looks like on the human chromosome uh, level. So here are the two genes, um, and uh, there, um, when there's been a chromosomal translocation, um, then uh, there's a fusion gene that forms, which then fu um, gives rise to a fusion protein that is thought to have oncogenic um, potential. So we asked if we could do what we did in, in mouse cells um, and generate chromosomal translocations in tumor-relevant genes by putting double-strand breaks on the two uh, chromosomes at the two loci. Uh, and uh, this particular initial experiment was done with zinc finger nucleases, but we've done uh, initially zinc finger nucleases and talons and now uh, CRISPR, uh, and they all basically um, do the same thing because they're all basically introducing double-strand breaks. Here's a little more uh, detail. Um, the fusions occur within introns, and so you can have a, ver a variety of breakpoint junctions. Uh, and then when uh, exon 7 of uh, EWS is fused to exon 6 of fly 1, the reading frame is maintained intact, so that, that's why you can get a fusion protein. Even though um, in the tumors from the patients, you can have a number of, uh, again, different breakpoint junctions. So we, um, uh, we directed, in this case, the zinc fingers to uh, where uh, the, um, in the area in which there were breakpoint junctions on both alleles and asked if we could uh, generate chromosomal translocations. And you can see here, using a PCR assay for the two derivative chromosomes, uh, just by expressing the, the two zinc finger nucleases, we could readily uh, obtain the PCR um, products for the two uh, uh, translocation chromosomes. So, um, <clears throat> and then uh, w when we could see these events at the DNA level, we could also see them at the mRNA level, uh, meaning that the, the protein, the fusion protein was going to be expressed. And then we could do this um, with um, uh, other translocations, NMT1-ALK uh, in uh, T-cell line, uh, again, uh, we could see the translocations by PCR and even um, the protein by uh, Western analysis, and this was a case with um, talons, and uh, nicely, uh, we could revert the, uh, in cells that have the translocation to begin with, we could revert the translocation by um, putting breaks um, in the two uh, translocated uh, chromosomes. And I'll emphasize this work was all done in collaboration with um, a former postdoc, Erica Brunet, at, um, in Paris. So um, over the years then, and I, I, I stopped actually uh, collecting this, but just to give a flavor, uh, a number of translocations have um, been modeled um, in a number of different um, cell lines. And um, often the work kind of stops um, there, uh, and that's for a few different reasons. So um, uh, one is that the translocation frequency is not that high, so um, you don't um, uh, just pick up a clone after expressing um, the nucleases and have a translocation. You have to often go through some effort. Um, and uh, that may seem counterintuitive because you're expressing an oncogenic protein, but in fact, um, it seems like um, once the, the fusion product is formed, uh, that often leads to a growth disadvantage. So that indicates that there are other things that have to happen to the cells uh, to have them um, become uh, transformed. Um, and a number of these experiments, too, have been done in uh, transformed cell lines, so the cells are quite screwed up. 
Um, and so um, uh, the, uh, a number of these experiments have been quite limited. So uh, we wanted to approach this issue by um, having uh, two um, modifications. And one was to have a way for enriching for uh, the translocations. And secondly, uh, to make the fusion gene um, protein uh, uh, expression conditional. So it wouldn't be expressed once there was a translocation, but in fact, we'd have to do something else and it would, using Cree recombinase. So in this case, um, the, the model that we were using uh, was the uh, translocation EWS WT1 in this uh, DSRCT um, tumor type. Uh, not a very common tumor, but um, there's very little that can be done to treat um, patients. And it, it's often um, in uh, young adults, um, and so maybe particularly tragic uh, when these uh, tumors arise because there's little uh, to do with them. And again, it's um, a fusion that leads to a transcriptional activation domain uh, being uh, fused to a, a DNA binding domain, turning on a set of new proteins. So um, uh, here's our approach again. Uh, we uh, create double-strand breaks within introns of um, the two partners. Uh, and um, uh, the modification was to have a homologous uh, fragment bringing in a selectable marker uh, so we could then enrich for events that had the chromosomal translocations. So here's the homology region in this um, shaded area. Uh, th these are about 800 base pairs in length. And uh, the selectable marker is promoterless. Uh, it relies on expression from the EWS uh, promoter. This is a splice acceptor, so there's a fusion then that occurs between uh, the uh, EWS um, in, uh, exon and a hygromycin exon, and then hygromycin can be, uh, a hygromycin resistance gene can be um, expressed. And uh, this uh, downstream um, uh, uh, event is not uh, per se selected for but uh, selecting for this uh, really enriches for finding uh, these events. So in the end, um, selecting for hygromycin resistance and screening by PCR, we hope to achieve a translocation. And then the idea would be this um, comes in with LOX-P sites, so um, the hygromycin gene would be expressed, but not the fusion protein. But then after Cree expression, um, the fusion protein would be expressed. So we can keep it off and then um, express it and ask what happens. So this is um, basically the experiment that we did. Uh, initially, screening uh, for this fusion is very successful because we're selecting for hygro. And then some other, uh, looking at the downstream um, uh, product, we could find some clones that had uh, undergone the translocation event. And you can see that here, um, where initially the two chromosomes, the two colors are separate for the two chromosomes, uh, and now we have a reciprocal uh, translocation involving one um, set of chromosomes. And the, um, we had homologous recombination on the one. Uh, um, uh, reciprocal translocation chromosome, but on the other chromosome, we just have a non-homologous end-joining event bringing the two ends uh, together. So we have a reciprocal uh, translocation. And uh, as uh, we designed, the expression of this fusion gene is conditional. Uh, so um, we have the hygro gene expressed initially. When we add Cre, then we get fusion protein, fusion gene uh, expression, and then you can see that the fusion protein on a Western. So now we have a way to um, generate translocations more efficiently, and we can study what happens once we turn on the uh, fusion uh, protein. And um, uh, this uh, just shows you that when we look at some of the target genes for um, this fusion protein that have been known from tumors, we can see that upon Cre expression, we express um, the fusion, uh, we express an active uh, transcription factor. But the problem 
is, is that these cells do not continue to proliferate. So it seems like this, um, what we consider oncogenic protein, as important as it is uh, apparently in the etiology of this disease, is not sufficient to transform um, the cells. So um, uh, we, we've actually continued doing these kinds of uh, experiments in some other uh, fusions from EWS. And one of the, I, I didn't mention this, but in this um, particular uh, experiment, we're using uh, a primary uh, cell line, mesenchymal cells that are thought to be um, the progenitor cell type for this uh, particular tumor. So they don't naturally um, proliferate, uh, but again, this um, fusion protein is not sufficient uh, to transform these cells. We've more recently uh, switched to using embryonic stem cells, which proliferate uh, extremely uh, well and, um, uh, and um, you know, should be able to survive as long as this protein is not um, killing the cells. And uh, we've used, uh, we've looked at a couple other models here, EWS Krebs, for example, and uh, we can achieve those um, translocations but what you can see in these embryonic stem cells, once we express Cre, uh, we do see the, um, the marker going away and the fusion uh, coming up. But over the time course of the experiment, by day 11, there's no more evidence of cells that had undergone um, the translocation. So clearly, the cells that have the translocation are at a growth uh, disadvantage. And, uh, and you, can, you can see this here by just looking at the, um, the fusion uh, transcript. This in another case uh, as well, uh, EWS, ATF, and it's the same uh, scenario. There have also been some uh, EWS, ATF uh, uh, translocations that have been described where um, the uh, protein would be out of frame because it uses a different exon. In this case, um, however, there's no problem in maintaining um, the expression of the fusion gene. So that fits with this protein is uh, inactive, but in this case where the protein would be in frame, this, uh, although we consider that this is likely to be oncogenic, it's not sufficient for transformation. So here we are. We can. Uh, select cells with translocations. We're using uh, human ES cells because they uh, are immortalized cells. And uh, moreover, they can be differentiated to different cell type to test uh, how these translocations impact different cell types, like mesenchymal cells, for example. And then we have a way of um, uh, conditionally expressing the fusion protein. And so now our emphasis is on this, trying to understand what factors allow, for example, through CRISPR screens, what factors um, promote the proliferation of uh, these oncogenic uh, translocation um, uh, fusion proteins uh, to survive and form tumors. So um, this is a continuing uh, study in the lab, again, in collaboration with C Christina Antonescu and my former uh, postdoc, uh, Fabio Vanoli. So uh, in the last few minutes, I'm going to um, talk about one other uh, topic um, that is uh, an amazing amount of fun for us. It, it doesn't have anything to do with tumor genesis, um, but rather uh, reproduction. So homologous recombination is essential for, homo for uh, reproduction in sexually um, uh, uh, sexual species. This is basically uh, why. Um, so if this, these are mouse oocytes in culture, and um, in a wild-type cell, of course, uh, the chromosomes will congress to the metaphase plate, whereas in a homologous recombination mutant, they don't, and so the chromosomes are very screwed up. So why, why is that? So in, uh, we have two types of divisions, mitotic divisions and um, a meiotic one division. In a mitotic uh, division, the two sister chromatids segregate to opposite poles. It, it doesn't matter uh, chromosome, the two homologs uh, for chromosome one, for example, have no relationship to each other necessarily in mitosis, 
uh, and it's just the sister chromatids that segregate by loss of cohesion. On the other hand, uh, cohesion is still important in the uh, first meiotic division, but the goal of the first meiotic division is to segregate um, the, uh, each homolog uh, pair. So uh, if this is chromosome one, uh, we want one uh, copy, the maternal or paternal chromosome one to go to one pole and uh, the other one to go to the other pole. So this involves a crossover, a homologous recombination event leading to crossing over between uh, the two homologs. And um, as important as, as recombination is, what's also important is the cohesion that allows these crossed over chromosomes to be held together uh, until um, the first meiotic uh, division. And then at that point, um, the two um, homologs can segregate away from each other. And of course, this will be a recombinant chromosome here. But uh, basically, one copy of chromosome or one pair of sister chromatids from chromosome one is going to one pole and the other to uh, the other pole. And again, we can look at this uh, more dramatically. Here is that oocyte I showed you before where the chromosomes are congressing at the metaphase plate. And this is what it looks like with tension being uh, built up, um, uh, holding the, the two uh, together because of the tension um, uh, together at the metaphase plate um, because of um, the um, action of the crossover together with cohesion. And then at anaphase, uh, cohesion is lost and, and the homolog pairs can go to opposite poles. And then in a recombination mutant, um, the chromosomes never congregate at the uh, metaphase plate. And eventually, uh, in this oocyte culture, the, um, the uh, spindle breaks down and, um, and the cell can't go any further. So that's why homologous recombination is critical in the first meiotic division. Now, it, of course, generates uh, genomic diversity as well, um, which is important for evolution. But at every single um, meiotic event, it's critical to have a, a homologous recombination. Uh, otherwise, you can't get gametes uh, forming. So how do you induce uh, recombination in a, in a germ cell? Well, you introduce double-strand breaks. And the protein that does it here is not a nuclease per se, but rather a topo-2-like protein. Uh, and so it cleaves uh, DNA and uh, forms a covalent a attachment, uh, which is eventually removed by uh, nicking on either side of the protein. So you end up with uh, a double-strand break uh, with some uh, resection uh, started. Now, SPO11 doesn't cut anywhere in the genome. It cuts um, in uh, what are called hot spots. So here's a region uh, from chromosome one in the mouse, and you can see um, the spacing of double-strand uh, breaks and how they're quite um, focus, focused at particular spots. And this is a region, a hotspot that we've used uh, several times, and I'll show you some more work on it. And this is what the double-strand breaks look like um, within this hotspot at a much higher uh, resolution. And uh, all the, you can see on a population basis that there are uh, double-strand breaks introduced at multiple locations, but most of them uh, focus uh, within about 100 uh, bases. So, um, uh, so SPO11 uh, makes double-strand breaks at hotspots, and it's these double-strand breaks that promote um, homologous recombination for the meiotic one division. And you can see um, uh, we've been able to, uh, meaning the field, have been able to really understand the steps that are involved. And uh, there have been two approaches to mapping double-strand breaks. One, uh, this one where single-strand DNA is measured by um, a group uh, at NIH, uh, Dan Camerini's lab. And uh, you can see the extent of the single-strand DNA that's formed using uh, this meiotic-specific uh, recombinase that will bind to it. And so um, they form this, uh, these nice peaks uh, on a genome average around where double-strand breaks form. And these are um, the SPO11 uh, maps, um, again, on a um, uh, 
uh, population basis that form uh, between these two uh, peaks, so in a much narrower region. So, okay, this is the basis of uh, recombination uh, or, or the initiation of recombination. What do we know um, about the mechanisms in mammalian cells? Well, this uh, goes back to that original paper I showed that is uh, more than 30 years old now. And uh, it was really a brilliant um, paper at the time. And uh, these are the steps that they proposed. Again, you have uh, a double strand break, resection, uh, strand invasion, and then the formation of uh, this double holiday junction. So these two uh, things that cross over. Uh, and the, these double holiday junctions can, um, they propose, be uh, uh, resolved uh, or cleaved in four different ways, as is shown here. Two that don't lead to crossing over, it's just a change of sequence right at the break site. And then two that lead to um, crossing over, but in different uh, ways. So um, this was uh, the original uh, proposal. So um, within the, the last, um, I would say, 10 years or so, um, so I told you the model's 30 years old, um, and of course there's been a lot of uh, work in yeast and other organisms uh, to try and understand how relevant um, this model is. And, uh, and so there's, there's been some modifications. So I'm just going to focus on a few um, points from the, um, uh, the original uh, uh, paper we did. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that we have hundreds of double-strand breaks uh, introduced into the genome, uh, as we can see by uh, foci of RAD51. But there are many fewer, only about um, uh, 24 uh, crossovers, about one per chromosome. So um, first of all, this is absolutely amazing, I would think, uh, to many of you if you haven't heard about this before, that the cell at each meiotic division, so this is a, the division that's going to transmit the genome, has hundreds of double-strand breaks int introduced into it. And so the cell must uh, repair these in a relatively uh, accurate way for the survival of the species, and it manages uh, to do that. But the original model um, suggested that there would be an equal um, uh, formation of crossovers and non-crossovers. But you can see from these counts in mammalian cells, unlike what was seen in yeast, that there are about 10 times more double-strand breaks um, than um, there are crossovers. The other um, point is we could start mapping at high resolution using uh, interspecific mouse crosses and allele-specific PCR and, um, and uh, hybridization, exactly what these events uh, look like at a nucleotide uh, level for crossing over or non-crossovers. And uh, here are a number of events, and the um, dots represent the polymorphisms that are uh, converted. So at that hotspot that I pointed out earlier, these are the polymorphisms. There's about one every 30 or so um, bases, but almost every single event just involves a single polymorphism. So that means the amount of conversion is really uh, short. The other point is um, each of these lines, uh, so the, lo the dot is a converted um, polymorphism, the line is the distance to the next um, polymorphism. But this is from a single meiotic cell, and this is the only change that occurred in the cell. Uh, the model predict that um, you could have uh, changes to both chromatids, but we're only seeing change uh, to one uh, chroma chromatid. So that means uh, for um, these uh, non-crossover events, there's um, no evidence that a double holiday junction is involved. Now, crossovers, it does seem like uh, um, the events are consistent with uh, double holiday junction formation. In this case, the gene conversion involves multiple polymorphisms uh, and so is much larger. So this is another thing that distinguishes crossovers from non-crossovers, the length of the gene conversion track, again, indicating that they uh, arise from different intermediates. So um, the idea that uh, we had a few years ago is that in, in uh, mice, we can, as has uh, more recently been proposed also for yeast, that uh, the um, non-crossovers -crossover come about 
from uh, an earlier intermediate uh, than the crossovers, and so use a, a different mechanism than double holiday uh, junction formation. Crossovers, on the other hand, seem like they would um, fit with the original uh, model. But one question uh, we asked is, is this really the case that you'd still have these two outcomes for crossing over? Uh, or is it more restrained? And um, to address that question, we've been using an MSH2 mutant to be able to maintain um, heteroduplex DNA and ask whether we see uh, these kinds of events predicted by the double holiday junction um, resolution. And so um, we have two options for resolution to give those two types of crossovers where heteroduplex DNA would be um, like this or like this. And so we asked, uh, what do these um, events look like in uh, cells? So uh, the first thing here is in the MSH2 mutant, you can see that we have many events that have um, uh, heteroduplex DNA. Uh, we call them mixed events, um, and, uh, and uh, by mathematical arguments, argue that this is uh, due to heteroduplex DNA. We also have some more complex um, events which uh, seem like they could be due to the, originally to um, the uh, two different um, models of resolution, but uh, I'll show you that that actually is not the, the case. So here are just um, a number of events that show no evidence of uh, heteroduplex DNA. But then we have, um, even in wild type, um, some events that seem to have heteroduplex DNA, or these more complex events. And uh, but basically, both these events are at the same position. So uh, the red to blue is always, or mostly on the, the left side, whereas here, the blue to red is mostly on the right side. Um, and this is uh, exaggerated even more in the MSH2 uh, mutant, where there's um, a polarity to how the heteroduplex DNA is. And then uh, secondly, if we look at the um, heteroduplex DNA uh, versus these more complex events, the uh, Shostak model would um, suggest that these would be uh, longer uh, gene conversion tracks compared to um, uh, this pattern one resolution. But you can see here that they're exactly the same length. So based on this, we think that um, the double holiday junction resolution predicted by the Shostak model is likely to be uh, correct, but focused only in one direction so that this resolution configuration predominates. And so uh, one option that kind of solves everything, I think, would be to say um, that the resolution of the holiday junctions occurs prior to ligation, when there's uh, NICs still in the DNA, that would then focus the resolution to just one out of the initial four predicted outcomes. Um, and uh, the, other, uh, the other point is that many of the events don't uh, show any evidence of heteroduplex DNA, suggesting that there's also uh, another step involved, which is D-loop uh, migration that I'd be happy to discuss for any aficionados. So in summary then, um, uh, we've been able to uh, do quite a bit in uh, uh, studying meiotic recombination in mice. This is a very active uh, field, a uh, very uh, exciting field. Um, and um, the uh, results that we've gotten recently, um, so this is unpublished work from a postdoc in the lab, Sean Peterson, um, is that um, this beautiful model from 30 years ago um, uh, is uh, likely very apropos, but just to one particular outcome, uh, a crossover from a defined resolution. And so we think that resolution may be guided by uh, nicks or gaps um, uh, uh, in intermediates. Um, and uh, so I'm going to leave it at here. And I hope I've convinced you about the importance of double-strand breaks and the repair for gene editing for uh, multiple um, normal cellular um, processes uh, involved in human health for cancer suppression uh, and uh, reproduction. And 
I just want to thank uh, the people in the lab who've done the work. I, I think I mentioned um, all of the former uh, lab members, um, but I'll point out Sean Peterson in particular, who's done the me recent meiotic work, and then Fabio Vinoli, a former postdoc uh, working with Christina Antonescu in pathology for the chromosomal uh, translocations. So thank you so much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor Jason. Now, please take a seat at the center of the stage for the question and answer session. Will Professor Wong please join the uh, Professor Jason on stage and moderate the session? Please raise your hands if you have any questions for Professor Jason, and our colleagues will pass the mic to you. Okay, thank you, Professor Jason, for your inspiring talk. Um, I have a question on. Uh, the NHEJ versus homologous recombination. So you said the cell has two mechanisms. How would a cell in, in the normal sense could regulate the use of either one of them? And how are there any knowledge that we know that we could um, promote a cell to use homologous recombination in gene editing to increase the chance of success? Thank you. Uh, that's an excellent question that I didn't have uh, time to go into. So um, we know that non-homologous end joining is important throughout the cell cycle. And uh, in homologous recombination, uh, you need homology. And hom homologs are always there, but they're actually not very efficiently used. It seems like the sister chromatid is the most important. And so when are you going to have the sister chromatid? Uh, it's S phase and G2. So um, homologous recombination is uh, relatively restricted to those uh, cell cycle phases. And, uh, but then once those cell cycle phases are entered, um, there is the ability to start uh, DNA end resection, which will then start the homologous recombination pathway. So this initial end resection uh, pathway, I think, is the central controlling point for whether you do homologous recombination or non-homologous end joining. Uh, so um, uh, you're right, the holy grail for gene editing really would be if you could uh, always have the cell do homologous recombination because then you could engineer very precise events and that's why we spend so much time focusing on it at the beginning. Now, I have to say my lab hasn't really um, tried to, um, you know, continue with the technology in terms of improving uh, homologous recombination um, uh, pathways. Um, one thing is it, for the work that we do in uh, mouse embryos to generate transgenic mice, um, actually it's pretty straightforward to get the homologous recombination events. And for uh, many of the genome engineering things we do in cell culture, we can often go through, um, like I showed with the translocations, some selection step um, using homologous recombination to, um, uh, to engineer things. So, uh, so we can do pretty well, but if your um, idea would be take a patient um, with a globin mutation where you just want to change one base and you want to do it by uh, homologous recombination with a fragment, that is not going to be that efficient. Although um, uh, I'm going to the CRISPR meeting in a couple weeks, and um, I've seen some abstracts that suggest that pe some people are doing much better in promoting uh, homologous recombination, uh, and we'll have to see what those uh, tricks are. Uh, some of the tricks have involved things um, that, that have already been published. Uh, for example, tethering an the homologous oligonucleotide to Cas9 itself, uh, tethering uh, uh, end resection protein to Cas9 itself to promote end resection. Um, usually those things work to some extent. It, it doesn't seem like it solves it for, you know, 100% uh, gene editing in any uh, cell type, but um, I, I think because so many labs are working on this that um, there are likely to be some major improvements. Excellent question. So. Questions from the audience? So, if, so over there. Thanks, Jason. Basically, I have two questions. One is uh, about uh, 
why you choose a mesenchymal cell type to do the uh, transformation assay? It's because that epithelial cell types, you will try to just uh, overexpress the oncogene like the fusion one. You will go into oncogene induced senescence. That's one thing that you want to try to use mesenchymal cells. And the other question is, is SPO11 actually the initiator of uh, meiosis by itself? Thank you. Uh, well, um, I'll answer the second question first. So, um, uh, SPO11 isn't the initiator of uh, my, the meiotic program overall. Um, there are a number of proteins involved in uh, getting the cells to enter uh, into meiosis, but SPO11 is the critical um, protein for introducing double strand breaks to introduce uh, to um, uh, induce uh, homologous recombination between chromosome homologs. Uh, it was interesting, um, so my colleague, um, so actually the yeast work from the um, uh, 80s and 90s had um, demonstrated that there must be about uh, 10 proteins that are involved in uh, ensuring that there are double strand breaks during meiosis. And then my colleague Scott Keeney uh, found uh, when he was a postdoc in Nancy Kleckner's lab, that SPO11 is the catalytic subunit. Um, and so it's the one that has this covalent um, uh, intermediate with DNA um, that is actually creating the break. And uh, at that point, it was noted that um, SPO11 was uh, a topoisomerase, uh, had homology to a, a topoisomerase uh, top six. Uh, but there are usually two subunits of TOPSIC, uh, and SPO11 would correspond to, an, to one of them, but not um, both of them. And so there was some thought, well, maybe there isn't another subunit, because no, normally a topoisomerase is going to reverse the reaction, and you, you don't want to reverse this. But actually, more recently, uh, a lab in France, uh, Bernard de Massey's lab, has found um, that uh, SPO11 uh, works um, as a heterodimer with um, uh, um, the other topo uh, subunit. So, um, but then uh, there are an amazing number of um, proteins still required for uh, double strand break formation besides this catalytic subunit. So the idea is that uh, you'd want to really highly, as you can imagine, highly control double strand uh, break formation, uh, even though the cell will have hundreds of double strand breaks, um, it still wants to uh, control where they happen. And one of the, for, for example, one of the um, important things is you, when you have homologous recombination between homologs, you have four chromatids, two from each um, homolog, <clears throat> and you only want to break uh, really one of the four uh, so you can repair uh, from the other um, uh, unbroken molecules. And the other thing is you probably don't want to have uh, two double strand breaks close to each other uh, because you wouldn't want to have uh, deletions. And so the, the whole uh, uh, process of double strand break, from, this is why probably SPO11 is not a nuclease, uh, but rather this topo2-like protein, uh, you can have this level of control uh, that's uh, really uh, rigid um, to um, uh, make sure you have <clears throat> breaks um, that are uh, spread out from each other uh, and not cutting the homologous uh, template. In fact, we know of one protein, ATM, when that's mutated, we have tenfold more uh, double strand breaks, so maybe uh, you know 2,000 double strand breaks in the cell, and uh, the cell uh, can't, um, can't manage that, and the ATM mice are infertile. Um, but the, what we've seen recently is um, we can often have deletions between two SPO11 hotspots in, a, in an ATM mutant mice where we don't see that uh, at any reasonable level. So there's a high level of um, control um, and uh, so you need breaks and you, uh, to generate homologous recombination, but um, you want to certainly uh, control them. But I still think it's remarkable, remarkable that <clears throat> the cell, in fact, the spermat the mouse spermatocyte is about 250 double strand breaks or so, but in human female, uh, in oocytes, there uh, are maybe 400 double strand breaks. So, 
it, and some other organisms, um, there could be a thousand double-strand breaks. Although other organisms like C. elegans and Drosophila, it's a, it's a, a pretty small number. So um, I, I think it's a real, really fascinating uh, topic. Now to get back to your uh, first question, I'm not sure I completely understood it, but we were using uh, mesenchymal stem cells um, as a, uh, a primary <coughs> cell type uh, with a diploid chromosome um, content, so uh, we could really engineer exactly the translocation that occurs um, in the patient cells. And uh, so obviously one could um, ectopically express um, the, the fusion protein and not worry about, or even, let's say, in EWS fly 1, target fly 1 to the EWS locus. But we were quite interested in generating um, this translocation at the endogenous loci for a few reasons. One is um, I'm actually interested in what the translocation it itself does in terms of like chromosome territories and uh, effects on uh, gene expression uh, overall. And then, of course, you're going to have a much uh, more precise um, uh, expression of the fusion protein. Um, you know, if, you, if you're if you overexpressing because you have some transgene, the, um, uh, the fusion protein, and I think this was true for a lot of the initial experiments, uh, tenfold more of the fusion um, protein that it's not really mimicking the natural situation very well. Um, but still, um, because these cells were basically primary cells, it was frustrating trying to do a lot of experiments with them, and so we've, um, we've gone to the ESL model where at least once we've generated the translocation uh, until we express CRE, the, the cells are growing beautifully, and um, we hope we can um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, differentiate them into different lineages to, to see what will mimic the, the disease status best what we can. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Professor Jason. I have two questions regarding the recurrent translocation you observed for the specific cancer type patients. The first question is how many recurrent translocation your lab or other labs have been established? And how many of them did you observe the reduce or reduction of proliferation of those cells? Every uh, translocation where we have uh, expression of the fusion protein has led to uh, a decrease in cell survival, cell fitness. Um, now, uh, we've been focused on this, um, this well, class of tumors uh, that are seen in sarcomas or sarcoma-like uh, diseases, not um, things like um, uh, lymphomas or leukemias, uh, but one of my colleagues has uh, mimicked not a translocation but a deletion um, in uh, lung tumor cells, um, and in that case, um, uh, he could just infuse CRISPR to um, uh, into the lungs uh, to create the specific deletion that leads to the fusion protein, uh, and in that case, the cells uh, took off and uh, formed tumors. So. Um, apparently, and it, interestingly in that case, it was a, um, a protein kinase, not transcription factor. So it may be that if you have a kinase involved um, that's deregulated, that's more likely to tr trigger without other things or very few other hits um, a tumor, whereas uh, something involving a, uh, a, a, a transcription factor may require a more complicated set of uh, things before you get uh, tumors. So, um, uh, so that, uh, um, that's basically what we've done. Uh, the follow-up question would be, you think those translocation you were studying were not driver mutations for those sarcomas? I, I think they're, they are drivers, but with kind of a quotation around it that uh, in a normal cell, it may, uh, well, you know, RAS is the same way, so um, uh, it, oncogene induced senescence, so if you express a mutant RAS in cells, um, the cells are not going to, you know, a primary cell line, they're not going to transform. You have to have other things happening, like in a, in a mouse model, you have RAS and, and P53, for example, um, and, uh, and then you'll get a, a tumor out. 
Um, actually, we, thus far, we're not really finding P53 is sufficient in our case. But so oncogene uh, induced senescence. So I, I'm thinking of um, these translocations in the same way that these are likely to be uh, drivers. They are proto oncogenes, but proto perhaps um, e even if it's a fusion because um, we need some other hits um, I'm expecting uh, for the cells to um, have a transformed phenotype. Thank you. Any further questions? There's some study that's shown um, bipolar disorder patients have uh, increased double strand breaks in the brain. I wonder if there's any evidence that the BRCA uh, breast cancer patients have higher psychiatric disorder, manic depression, or oh, suicidal? I, you know, I have, I have no idea if those studies have been uh, done. It's, um, it's an interesting question. But one thing is um, the BRCA patients uh, are heterozygous, um, and then the tumors end up being homozygous. Um, they've lost the wild-type allele. So um, it's not like the brain cells would be um, uh, mutant to begin with. They're, they'd have to have a second event. The other thing is if most cells are post-mitotic in the brain, um, we don't think homologous recombination is going to be very important um, uh, in that context because, again, you don't have the, the sister chromatid. But, um, you know, that, that's not to say there can't be some brain disorders coming from uh, BRCA mutations. Um, Indra Verma had done some experiments um, suggesting that if he knocked out BRCA1, he would get um, some phenotype in the brain, he would get some phenotypes. Uh, but that would be, you know, uh, kind of po postnatal development um, when the cells would still be uh, dividing. Um, the, maybe the only thing I can really say is there are a few children born or have been a few children born um, with biallelic mutations. So again, um, women or men with BRCA1 or two mutations that are tumor predisposed um, have one allele mutated and the other is wild type, and most of the time the tumors um, lose a wild type allele. Um, we don't know that, we don't know of any, um, any live births involving um, null mutations in both genes, but if you have a, a partial loss of function in one copy of BRCA2 and, um, and a complete loss of function, you can, some children have been born. And in that case, um, the, child, it, the children die very early um, around infancy, uh, and of course they're not getting breast tumors, what they're getting are um, a set of other tumors. Um, leukemias, um, uh, brain tumors, and kidney tumors. So in that case, clearly um, those children can get um, brain tumors, but then that fits with, you know, it's an early postnatal uh, time uh, when there's been a lot of uh, rapid proliferation. Um, but um, in that case, those, those children are more likely to have microcephaly, um, uh, but they don't, they don't survive they don't typically survive um, infancy, um, but um, but there's no indication of any psychiatric disorder per se, um, just a brain disorder from uh, microcephaly. Good evening, Professor Jason. Um, thank you for your talk today. Um, I found your insights about HR deficiency in tumorigenesis particularly fascinating from the point of view of mutations. You've also mentioned that NHEG is involved in the immune system, so I was curious, would you think there's anything notable about the dynamics of uh, homologous repair versus NHEG in terms of cancer immunology? Well, it, um, it's, it's really interesting because, um, uh, you know, in the mice, as I mentioned, a homologous recombination deficiency can lead to uh, very early embryonic lethality in BRCA1 or 2, we think that's probably true in humans, and um, NH, NHEJ deficiency <clears throat> often leads to um, death uh, in embryogenesis, uh, but around the, um, uh, the early, uh, the late embryogenesis or early postnatal stage, and that's, uh, there's actually a lot of uh, apoptosis in the brain at that time. Uh, and so, um, but interestingly, when, when you have uh, survivors, um, those NHEJ mutants don't usually get um, tumors, and the idea is that if you have NHEJ mutations, you're much um, 
more likely just to apoptose rather than form um, a tumor. Now in mice you can drive that if you have a p53 mutation and then there are lots of lymphomas, um, but um, uh, uh, actually um, whenever NHEJ mutants are found in people, mutations are found in people, those um, people don't usually have a tumor phenotype. What they have is an immunodeficiency. So that's um, a prime uh, giveaway that there could be an uh, NHEJ deficiency in people. Um, the other point being if, if um, somebody does have some something uh, like a uh, a tumor and then they, they go for radiation and, and then they may be killed by it because um, they have an NHEJ uh, deficiency. So there's quite, a, um, even though both processes are important, uh, be, probably because when they act, um, it's quite, um, the consequences are, are quite different. And um, one of the things I find interesting is um, uh, you, you can see like the cell cycle thing is so important. If you look in um, mutants uh, uh, at, uh, during the second half of embryogenesis, uh, HR mutants will have actually brain apoptosis to some extent, but it's only in the proliferating cells, whereas an NHEJ mutant has it later in embryogenesis and in the non-proliferating cells. So even in one organ, organ you can um, quite uh, readily see the different usage of the two. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. Very interesting, thank you. You're welcome. So, Professor Chang. Hi, Mary, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Okay. Really sharing your uh, scientific career and your study on uh, DNA repair and the science. And from the question that we've been hearing, I'll just talk to Woody Chang next to me, that I feel, we feel like we're in a, high-level gone research conference on gene editing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to ask a, a scientific question, but rather, you know, I think for us, for most of us doing science, is, uh, it's a rather rocky road. Uh, and therefore, I was wondering if you can actually share with us your journey as a scientist, a tech youth, you know, from a budding scientist to where you are. So, because we have a lot of budding scientists, I think, sitting in the audience, and I noticed there's a lot of high school students actually arrived to listen to your lectures as well. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can actually share with us what it takes for someone like yourself to do science and what it takes to be successful in science. You know, it, it's interesting. Well, first of all, um, uh, when I was uh, in high school, I started learning about DNA and I thought that was all very um, fascinating and, uh, and then that kind, kind of continued into college days. Um, but I didn't do any research in, in uh, undergraduate um, days, really, and it, it took to getting to MIT to, to graduate school to do um, research. So one thing I think students these days just have such a tremendous advantage because they can do high-level um, research as an undergraduate um, by doing internships in labs or during lab work um, during the school term. Um, but um, when I, um, so I, I thought going to graduate school was a, um, a, you know, it would be interesting, but it, it was just so <clears throat> marvelous to be introduced to um, high level science and the interesting questions and, you know, finding out what was uh, new, like uh, it hadn't been very long uh, before I started graduate school where using recombinant DNA was being, uh, used frequently, and so that was an exciting um, period of time. And, uh, you know, thinking that, um, well, you know, we've done that, so can we do anything that's as important again as recombinant DNA? And then um, here we are uh, many years later, and we can uh, modify the genome. And so um, the uh, amazing, uh, d you know, discoveries and advances um, that keep happening, and you, you think that things might slow down, but because you know we have the genome sequence, or you know this new technology or that new technology, um, d developmental biology is just being transformed by uh, imaging, for example. So all of this is is just so wonderful for the continued growth of bi in biomedical um, research, and um, you know I think so much of. Um, uh, 
of being successful just um, because there are so many hard knocks around, along the way um, from different directions. Um, it, it's just being so fascinated by uh, learning about all of um, these things and uh, you know, science is, is really interesting and it's a kind of a privilege to, to do it to, you know, your, your life is, um, is focused on new uh, discovery and um, I never really seriously considered uh, medical school, I thought, you know, in a way that's um, too hard because often, uh, you know, you can't really successfully um, treat patients and, and um, you're, you're kind of so limited because you're working with a, with a human in terms of what you can, what you can do, but um, biomedical science, you know, everything is wide open in terms of uh, discovery and um, so I think anybody who really has a passion for that can be uh, hopefully successful, but um, that that passion needs to be there. Otherwise, you know, getting grants and getting um, uh, papers published, and uh, you know, the the drought between um, scientific discoveries can sometimes be long. But if you um, love what you're doing, then um, you know you can put up with all of that. So, Professor, thanks for your talk. I really appreciate that. So, it's actually my first time to hear about uh, double strand breakage uh, initiated uh, at the beginning of the meiotic cell division and even in a site specific manner, right? So, uh, I wonder if a lot of cancers, then I think uh, a lot of cancers, a lot of disease, they always have a specific breakpoints at a particular position in the chromosome. I wonder if those uh, specific double strand breakage breakage point during the meiotic cell division has anything to do with those disease-causing things? You know, we don't usually think so. So um, SPO11, uh, for example, is um, generally specifically expressed only in, in germ cells that are undergoing meiosis. Now, you can, actually, it was interesting when we first got SPO11, it was in, the, in a thymus um, uh, database, not, not a germ cell database. Um, but um, uh, there are a whole set of genes called um, cancer testes um, antigens where you actually can see expression of some my meiotic genes in uh, cancer cells. But um, there's, no, um, there's no evidence that <clears throat> um, these genes are active per se in generating, for example, SPO11 as a cancer testes antigen in terms of um, generating uh, rearrangements uh, in that you see in cancer cells, um, I, it might it might come about at some point. But I think one one thing is okay. SPO11 is um, uh, expressed, but then there are a whole series of other genes that need to be expressed to get a double strand break. Um, you know, at least five, maybe more. And so I think it's unlikely that um, you'll have that many uh, genes expressed, e even apparently, in any particular tumor cell to get SPO11 cleavage. With the questions? Okay. Questions there? Professor Maria Jason, thank you for your inspiring talk. Um, of, the, of the two repair pathway for the double-strand breakage, how the cell cycle regulates the choice of the repair pathway? And also, um, is there any competition between the two repair pathways in the cell? Thank for, you. For sure there is competition. Um, so, uh, and, and also there is cell cycle regulation, especially for uh, homologous recombination, because as I mentioned, you need um, to have homology, and particularly that's when you have the sister chromatid, so that's going to be in uh, S and uh, G2 phases. But we've done these kinds of experiments that um, if you uh, knock out non-homologous end joining events, then you get more homologous recombination. And so we think you know, the normal proteins involved in non-homologous end joining are going to be uh, preserving the DNA ends um, uh, and kind of keeping them intact. Um, but if you get rid of that, then you're going to have more of this end resection and, and uh, promote homologous recombination. Uh, on the flip side of things, you don't usually see a, ho a whole lot of more homologous recombination, uh, non-homologous end joining in a homologous recombination mutant. And it's likely because you start um, uh, prohibiting the pathway by having an end resected uh, intermediate. So if, you, if your homologous recombination mutant is at that end resection step, you can get more non-homologous end joining. But once you've started the process, 
by resecting the non-homologous and joining pathway can't do um, much with those overhangs. So, um, so there's definitely com competition. We also see cooperation because sometimes you can start by homologous recombination and finish by non-homologous and joining. So, um, you know, this is a really active area of research. Let's give, great, give a great applause to Professor Jason for her wonderful talk. Thank you so much. May I now invite Professor Fort Tai Fai, Editing Vice Chancellor of CUHK, and Professor Andrew Chang, Head of Shaw College, to present the souvenirs. Professor Fort and Professor Chang, please.